I'm talking about anger inequality. Now, yesterday, Mike talked about unconscious biases that we all have, whether we like it or not. It doesn't mean we're not good people. And he talked about what Facebook is doing to try to get people to have crucial conversations with themselves, right, and with others to make this problem discussable. Because if it isn't discussable, it certainly isn't solvable. Right? And then we heard Susan Cain talk about similar kinds of unconscious biases and lack of self-awareness around introverts and extroverts and how that can get us in trouble. Now, these situations with unconscious bias, they're unfair, they're unjust, they're wrong, but they're real. They're there. And we don't really know how to change it in society. We don't have a, a BS answer at this point, right? So Joseph and Chase and I thought, how do we make this link with unconscious bias to crucial conversations? How does it affect crucial conversations? And how should it affect the kinds of skills that we try to offer an individual who finds himself or herself working in an organization that has lots of unconscious bias in it, where he or she can't change that bias, not on their own, but how can they survive it? How can they cope with it? Does that make sense? So we set up an experiment, and I'm going to tell you about the research we've been doing. We've been doing it the last few months. It's not done yet. It's done enough to publish, but there's a lot more work to be done. So let me introduce you to Sharon. Now, let me describe who Sharon is. Sharon's, of course, an actor, right? And the best lines we had written for her, Chase McMillan wrote. They're the ones you're going to hear her using, right? Now, we had about 2,500 people watch Sharon in different interactions and judge her. They only saw one clip. No one ever saw more than one. But I'm going to group you into third. So this group here, this two, the two rows of tables here, Susan is a manager who's going to be joining your organization next week. And she's, her role will be that she's your boss. Okay, She's coming into the organization. She'll be your boss. Okay. The middle two tables, she's a manager, she's joining your organization, she's going to be a peer of yours, you're both managers, you both have staff, and you'll be collaborating and working together with Susan. Right? The last group, Susan, she's a manager, she's going to be joining your organization next week, she's going to report to you, she's going to be your subordinate. Make sense? So... Let's see Susan. She's in a fairly routine conversation, kind of a status update, not a crucial conversation, no big disagreement, no big emotional thing. Here she goes. I can report on the Clark Project. We finally received the specs and we'll begin the design process this Wednesday. Mike said he'll need my design outline by this Friday if we're going to hit deadline. My calendar is blocked out and I have all the resources I need, so I think we should be good to go. Does anyone have any concerns? That's, that's Sharon. Now, I want to have you do a poll. So take out your smartphones or your computer if you're using that. Hopefully you signed in yesterday. That should still be good for today. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to evaluate Sharon based on that little bit that you've seen of her around how much status, power, and independence does Sharon deserve? Status, power, and independence, where E would be very little, A would be very much. We can see the scores starting to come. Numbers are jumping up. This is good. Now, we're seeing a fairly positive impression of this manager who's going to be joining our organization. And we saw this in our research, right? Now, I want to move to the next video. Now, if you'd seen the first video, you'd never get to see this one. So it's a whole different group of people saw this next video. This is a crucial conversation. You're going to see that she disagrees with the group and that she seems to believe the stakes are high. And you're going to see some, hear some emotion in her voice. Here it goes. I'm not on board with the direction this decision is going. We're chasing a market that doesn't exist. It's as if we're completely ignoring the data. I wouldn't say ignoring the data. We need to make significant changes to the existing plan or do additional testing until we find more convincing trends, even if it does take more time and expense. No, we don't really no wait, I'm not finished. 
I won't back down from this position, and I'm not going to commit my team and resources to this project until we have more conclusive evidence to work with, period. Now, for this group of people, Sharon's gonna be your boss starting next week. For this group, she's gonna be a peer where you work with. For this group, she's a subordinate who's going to work for you. So, let's see, I'm moving to the next poll. Am I there? Seeing how the scores are dropping a little? Not a huge surprise, right? She didn't do the best in the Crucial Conversations course, right? Maybe she hasn't mastered all of her stories. Some emotions kicking in. We describe it as being, she's being very forceful, right? She's also being kind of abrupt. She's being not a real good listener, right? It's real, it happens. It could happen to any of us out there, okay? Now it's dropped fairly substantially. I wanna show one more scene with her. Ask yourself, what's different about this scene? The script is exactly like the one you just saw. I am not on board with the direction this decision is going. We're chasing a market that doesn't exist. It's as if we're completely ignoring the data. I wouldn't say. We need to make significant change to the existing plan or do additional testing until we find more convincing trends. Even if it does take more time and expense. We don't really have no, more wait. time. No, wait. I'm not finished. I won't back down from this position. And I'm not going to commit my team and resources to this project until we have more conclusive evidence to work with, period. What was different? We didn't just use Sharon, we also used a guy, right? When it was a guy, his status, the status, the uh, power, the authority that they thought he should have, the independence he should have, dropped pretty fast, and it dropped in a straight line depending on how emotional, how forceful he was. So there is a backlash when you move from a normal conversation to a crucial conversation when you disagree and to the extent that you show that anger, that for the extent that you haven't mastered that story, you're gonna get punished by the people watching you. Now let's watch for Sharon, for the woman. That's the gender inequality effect. They get dinged far worse than the men. Now we've got thousands of subjects, right? This is a profound effect. We're not the first people to find it, right? But we're the first people to see it in the context of crucial conversations. And I wanna add some, uh, some tentativeness to this, okay? When this person, Sharon or Trent was the, guy's, the actor's name, when they were your boss, there was no sex effect. And the drop in status was far greater. When it's your boss, you're kind of like, oh, 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 that's my boss? Tomorrow? That's going to be my boss, right? It, it's, it's so severe that the sex effect is washed out. When it's a peer, that's when the sex effect is really strong. When it's a subordinate, we found the sex effect there too. So we ask ourselves, what's going on? We try to get inside the head of the observers. Okay, so you're observing this person and you're, and you're telling yourself a story, right? What's the story you're telling yourself that causes you to drop their status as much as you do? What is it? Well, we have some clues. We have clues from prior research. This is research done at Yale by Breskel and Ullman. And one of the findings that they had was that the derogated women, that that, that loss of perceived status was highly correlated with whether they thought the woman had lost her temper or was out of control. So we looked for that as well and we found it. In fact, the observer's judgment that the man or woman had lost control and lost their temper was a better predictor of their drop in status than whether they were a man or a woman. So it's not, are you a man or a woman? It's, have you lost control? Here's where the sexism comes in. Our observers were much quicker to judge that a woman had lost control. That a woman being a little bit assertive had lost it, right? That's what we wanna deal with. How can we, if, if that's the, the world you're living in, is there something you can do short of fixing that world, which is what we'd like to do long-term, is there something you can do to survive and succeed in that world? That's what we wanted to test. 
The first thing we tested, we called it a behavior frame. So this is a little statement. It lasts about four seconds. And it goes in front of this angry statement. In the laboratory, what we did was we simply recorded it and then we edited it in front, right? Watch it and listen for the impact that it has. I'm going to express my opinion very directly. I'll be as specific as possible. I'm not on board with the direction this decision is going. We're chasing a market that doesn't exist. It's as if we're completely ignoring the data. Okay, that was the behavior frame. Here's what our theory was when we, when we tried that. We thought what the behavior frame would do is it would signal deliberation and intentionality, right? If the concern is that someone has lost control, that they're speaking off the script, that they're speaking spontaneously, this statement says, oh no, this isn't spontaneous, right? <laughs> this is intended, deliberate. And so what it does is it prevents that judgment that they've lost control. Now, did it work? It did. It worked for both men and women, and it worked pretty well. The, what we're seeing here is 100% would be 100% of the loss of status, and so it didn't prevent, what it did is it prevented about 10% of that loss in status. So it worked, it worked at a highly significant level, but not at an outrageously important level. And here we had even more subjects. We had nearly 8,000 observers. So this is really solid kinds of data. So you'll see behavior frame. The next thing we tested, we called it a value frame. Now here's what we're thinking of with the value frame. First, just as any of these frames, it signals deliberation and intentionality. It prevents the, the notion that she's lost control, but it does something in addition. It explains her emotion. It explains it. It doesn't just describe what she's gonna do. It explains why she's being forceful or angry. And it makes it a virtue. Here's what it sounds like. I see this as a matter of honesty and integrity, so it's important for me to be clear about where I stand. I'm not on board with the direction this decision is going. We're chasing a market. That I see this as an issue of honesty and integrity. It's like explaining why you're going to show your emotion. It requires a level of self-awareness that we don't always have in the moment, but if we do have that moment, if we can frame it, it's a little like a contrast statement, but a little different. It's explaining what we're gonna do and why before we do it. Now I wanna show the example with our male actor because it worked there as well. Here's what it looked like. I see this as a matter of honesty and integrity, so it's important for me to be clear about where I stand. I'm not on board with the direction this decision is going. We're changing. Right, so when we look at this, the value frame worked substantially better than the behavior frame. For whatever reason, it worked far better for our male actor than it did for our female actor. I don't have a good clue as to why that is. They're using just one male and one female actor. There are obviously differences in acting that are hard to predict. If we, if we had 20 actors in each condition, maybe we'd see something a little different. But I think this data shows that the value frame works really strongly. I wanna show one more. This is a risky one, it's an interesting one. We call it an inoculation frame. What it does is it, again, it signals deliberation and intentionality, it prevents this lost, lost temper judgment. It also warns about implicit bias. It warns you, be on the lookout. Here's how it sounds. I know it's a risk for a woman to speak this assertively, but I'm going to express my opinion very directly. I'm not on board with the direction this decision is going. We're chasing a market that doesn't exist. It's as I know it can be a risk for a woman to speak this assertively. Look how well that worked. It cued people that, oh, my unconscious bias could judge her here. Maybe I should correct for it. Now, here's a concern. Remember the, 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 the book Influenced by Cialdini? talked about the Hare Krishnas who used to go into airports and take advantage of reciprocity. They'd go in and they'd pin a flower on your lapel and then ask you for money. And the reciprocity norm here in the US is, is if someone gives you something, you should give them something in return. And it worked, people opened their wallets and gave them money, but they didn't feel good about it. 
They felt manipulated by it. And so they also lobbied Congress to, to force the Hare Krishnas out of airports. That's why you don't see them there anymore, right? So the inoculation statement might be like that. It may work in the moment, but could it cause long-term problems for a woman who uses it? Could it be seen like using the gender card? We don't know, we haven't done the research. What would you recommend that a woman do? Get a hand raise. How many people would encourage a niece to use this skill? How many would, enc how many would encourage them not to use this skill in a frequent way? Frequent. Many say not using it frequently. Now, let me give a counterpoint. I was talking to an executive at a Silicon Valley company, and he said, I could imagine, since we're trying to change our culture and, try, and we're trying to admit and talk about unconscious bias, I could imagine a woman saying, um, you know this is gonna sound like a broken record because I'm always gonna remind you that it's risky for a woman to speak up in our culture. We're trying to change that here. And he said, there might be a way that a person could use that repeatedly as part of a strategy to change the culture. I don't know. Let's go to the BS guy's take on this. This is meant to be a quick and light summary of this research. <laughs> 